it is from Christine Podesky. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the book Mind Over Mood. She's one of the authors. Mm -hmm. This model is presented in that book. Great book. It'll be on the resource list at the end. Um, I don't know why there's little S's on it. Those aren't supposed to be there. Um, so this has, I've, I've drawn it over here because as I do the case examples, I'm actually going to model for you guys what I do in session with my patients. So you're not only getting sort of a theory behind it, but you can see kind of like how I do this. Um, but there are a couple other things that are really important in the cognitive model, and this is our kind of physical reactions or physiological sensations and our environment. Um, so starting with kind of the environment, I'm just going to illustrate for you guys how this model sort of works, and then we'll get into some specific examples so you can see the meat of it. The environment is something that obviously is external to us, but it affects everything that we do. Sometimes we can change our environment or change the situation that we're in. This goes for teens, for ourselves, for adults, for everyone. Um, but sometimes we can't change the environment. And when we can't, it still has an impact on the internal cycle of thoughts, physical reactions, moods, and behaviors. Um, so they're all intertwined, and you're going to see this really illustrated in those examples. But thoughts play a really major role in affecting our physical sensations, our behaviors, and our moods, which is why kind of that book, Mind Over Mood, talks about the mind component a lot. How do we change our thoughts to change the way that we feel, to change the way that we act, and, and whatnot. So we're going to start with really looking at how our thoughts can impact each of these areas. So I think we're all pretty aware that the way that we think about things affects the way that we feel, right? But let me give you some examples. So Let's say that you're talking to somebody that you know, um, and you ask them a question. So I'm setting up the situation here. This is the environment. So their reaction to you when you ask the question is they kind of make a face at you, okay? If your thought about that is, oh no, I put them off by my question. They're angry with me. You're going to feel, I don't know, maybe upset, down. Maybe you're going to be mad at yourself. Maybe you'll be mad at them, right? But let's take that same situation. So you've asked this friend a question, and they've made a face at you. And you notice that you smell something. And you're kind of making a face, too. So your thought is, I wonder what that smell is. They must be smelling it, too. Your mood is going to be neutral, whatever it was before. It's probably not going to have a huge impact, right? What about um, same situation, asking this friend a question, and they make a face at you. But your thought is, wow, they've been so overwhelmed lately. They've been really distracted. I bet that they lost track of what I was saying, and now they're confused by my question. Well, that's going to make you feel more empathic. Maybe um, you know, you're going to want to repeat yourself or something like that. So the mood that you experience in that situation depends totally on what your sort of perception of the situation was. Same situation, but the way that we think about it changes the way that we feel. Right? <clears throat> So now let's do the thought-behavior connection. So I'll give you guys another example. Let's imagine that you're at some family event, and you see an elderly relative sitting kind of across the room, and they're starting to get up from the table. If you think, oh my gosh, they need some help, your behavior is likely to be that you go help them, right? But let's say, same situation, you see them trying to get up from the table, and you think, gosh, it's so great that they're still getting around on their own you're not likely to go help them in that case, right? Behavior's different. Um, similarly, if you've got you know, relatives sitting near them and you notice that they're trying to get up and you're maybe thinking, ooh, they look a little unsteady, it's a good thing that my family is around to help them, you probably won't be the one to change your behavior and walk over there because you, you know, assess the situation and determine there's someone else to help. So those are just thoughts, same situation, has a direct impact on our behavior. Um, my favorite, though, is how our thoughts impact our physical well-being, and there's lots of examples of this, um, but I'll give you one that, uh, that is one of my favorites. And, you know, when I was learning this model, it always kind of struck me odd. How can the way that we think about things actually affect us really physically, like directly, like not indirectly? But there's research to say, for example, that when people get a cancer diagnosis, if their beliefs, so their thoughts, are that this is beatable, they actually have a longer lifespan than if they believe that it's a death sentence. And so 
and there's lots of different kinds of examples about this, but it's the way that we think about things can actually affect our physical well-being. Um, and so thoughts are very powerful. Um, so this cycle, uh, it all reinforces itself. I mean, if you imagine just that initial situation where, you know, you're talking to a friend and you, you know, they make a face at you and your, you know, your thoughts are that they are, you put them off in some way and they, they must be irritated with you. You might feel bad about that. Then you might be likely to stop talking. You might get nervous about it. When we get nervous, like your heart starts pounding, things like that. And then you might be, you know, stopping the conversation and then thinking I'm feeling really bad that I put them off so you're feeling worse in the mood and you can kind of see how all of these things play off of each other and it just continues. Um, so let's move on to some specific examples. Okay, so this is, I realize what the S's are, that's because my formatting is off, so it's thoughts, <laughs> physical reactions, so I'm sorry about that. Um, this is where I'm going to use the whiteboard with you guys. So um, the first example is going to be a teenager who is acting out. Um, so you might get a call, I've had cases like this where they're like, you know, my kid is you know, sneaking out of the house, my kid's experimenting with drugs, my kid is experimenting sexually, something that they're not pleased that their kid is doing. Um, and I don't know what to do, can you help me? So. What we want to look at is, is that normal teen behavior? Are they curious? Are they testing the limits? Is that what's happening? Or is there something underlying going on? So what I'm going to show you is sort of what this cycle looks like when there is something going on, um, more than just sort of normal teen behavior. So we already know the behavior. The behavior is acting out. I'll put that and then try to get out of the way. So the behavior is acting out. So what we want to look for is we want to look for if the teen is acting out, now you know you have them in your office, why are they acting out? What is the underlying motivation for them acting out? Um, so you try, so when that happens, we look for thoughts that are sort of like some apathy, depression, just sort of like, I don't really care about anything. Those are the kind of thoughts we're looking for to see if this acting out might be related to something more like depression. So the thoughts are going to be, um, why not? Like, so what are you thinking when you're doing this acting out behavior? Well, why not? Um, a really good one, if you can get them to say it, although it can be tricky, is like, I don't feel much anyway. And I'm just going to put dot, 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 so I'm not writing forever. But I don't feel much anyway. So maybe there's doing this thing that's kind of exciting and out of the norm. Maybe that's going to make me feel something. Because they're feeling kind of numb, right? Which I skipped ahead, but there we go. Um, not that numb is a mood, but it's uh, kind of the opposite of it. So it goes in that category. Um, maybe this will make me happy. Or excited and again that's that I'm not feeling anything let me try something extreme to see if I can kind of jolt myself into this you're looking for anything about the why and the motivation anything that might you're kind of fishing is there anything that might make you consider that this is more of a depression rather than just kind of rebellion so then we look at mood um, and we're looking at like Maybe some depression, um, maybe irritability, because we know in teens that when they're depressed, it doesn't always come out as sadness or depression. It sometimes comes out as irritability or anger. Um, sometimes there's sadness, lack of pleasure, just not really being able to enjoy much. In these kinds of cases, usually it's numb. I don't feel much of anything. What's your mood like? I don't know. I don't really feel anything. They're not sad. They're not happy. They're just numb. Um, physically, what you're looking for in these situations is probably more of along the lines of depression. So we're looking for like low energy, lethargy, maybe sitting around a lot, maybe being slowed down, um, wanting to sleep a lot. Generally tired and all of that kind of thing. So we've got kind of this cycle. 
Then what I tend to ask them is like, okay, well, when you have this behavior, we've kind of labeled everything here. So you acted out, did it work? And usually if we're dealing with something like teen depression that's coming out in this way, what we're seeing is that it didn't work. They didn't really feel anything different. And then sometimes they feel guilty. Well, if they're feeling guilty, that's going to affect their thoughts, right? Why did I do that? Some name, self-name calling. I'm so stupid. I'm an idiot. Why did I think that would help? And then sometimes even, maybe, I should, I should try something else, right? Like more extreme something else. So sneaking out of the house didn't work. That wasn't enough of a thrill to make me feel something. So maybe I should try something else. So this can actually increase, which then if it's still not working, we're coming back to this. Well, if we're thinking, why did I do that? I'm so stupid. I can't figure anything out. Nothing's working. Of course, we're going to feel more depressed, right? Which is going to increase these physical sensations. We're not going to feel much, which is going to make us try something else because nothing's working. Might as well be more extreme. You guys can kind of see the problem here. The cycle reinforces itself. So, we also know, we're going to talk about kind of the consequences of these behaviors. Like, obviously, if we stay, if we allow the team to stay in this cycle, the consequences here are pretty obvious. There's negative consequences to acting out. It just depends which form of acting out they've chosen. So that's one example. This is what we're looking for to see if the acting out behaviors are something like depression. And you can tell the role that the thoughts have in this, if we can get to why they're doing it, then we're gonna have a much better sense of what's going on. So, we're gonna erase this, and we're gonna do the next example. I have a quick question on Go that. Go for it, yeah, please. Um, what if uh, the behavior is um, a lack of behavior, or, or, or basically they, they, they freeze instead of try something else, and they become frozen? Great question. Um, we will, I might have, one of the other examples that I'm going to give might address it more, but basically what we're looking for there is kind of, we do the same sort of process and we'd expect to see like if they're freezing and they're not doing, one of my examples is like not doing homework, so we'll just jump to that real quick. So if we say, okay, they're not doing any homework, um, we want to see what their thoughts are about it, right? Like why aren't you doing the homework? Um, what, you know, what are, the, what are the kind of driving thoughts behind it? So it might be, it's too much, um, I can't do it. That's a big one in these, these kinds of situations. I can't, I can't do it, I'm not capable of doing it, which you can kind of hear that low self-esteem, the depre it's depression self-talk basically that we're talking about. Um, and the way that that cycle reinforces, like I said, I'll, I'll get to in a minute, but basically, you know, it's, we have to stop that cycle too. Just because they're not acting out does not make it a positive cycle. Um, they're still stuck, right? They're still not doing anything, which might mean not going to school, which is the next example, not doing their homework, uh, not engaging with friends or family, isolating, still a negative cycle. Um, and so we would look for, actually the cycle wouldn't look that different when you're kind of assessing for it. We would just ex expect different kinds of thoughts other than like, oh, I should try something extreme. It's more like, I don't feel like doing anything, nothing's going to work anyway, it has a little more of like a hopeless flair to it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and I think if that doesn't answer the full question, let me know at the end of the case examples and I'll come back to it. Question. Go for it. Um, how do you differentiate stress and depression? And is depression and anxiety sometimes an underlying of stress? Yes. Because often I hear teenagers say, it's the stress. Yes. And I think... Sometimes it's exactly the same thing. Sometimes stress is depression and anxiety, and that's just a different word for it. Um, sometimes teenagers come in, you know, I think, I know I'm guilty of this. I, ha I use the word anxiety all the time. I'm very familiar with it. It's one of the things that I treat the most. I know the word anxiety. Teens don't always know the word anxiety. Like, they've heard it, but what is that really? That's not the word they necessarily use at school. They use the word stress, right? So sometimes stress is depression and anxiety, sometimes the stress causes depression and anxiety, and sometimes being depressed and anxious makes it really hard to do things like go to school, do homework, things like that, and that causes more stress because now they're 
behind and now they're you know worrying about different things. I don't know. I risk uh, behavior is sometimes normal. Adolescence. Absolutely. And so this is the thing. This is why we're looking at this kind of from all of these different um, angles and trying to look at what this cycle would look like if it's being motivated by depression, anxiety, overwhelm, if it's a mental health concern. Because some of this is normal teen behavior. Usually what you'll see in the one that I just erased is they're less, they're not so motivated to change. Usually when I have a teen with me who is acting out because they're depressed, they're not real happy with how things are going. They're upset. They want something to be different. They just don't know what's going on or how to make it different. But they're not happy. When it's more kind of like experimental teen behavior, more fun, um, they don't necessarily want it to change. They're not necessarily upset by it. I mean, they may not like the consequences of it, but there might not be that motivation. Um, and that's where kind of the mood comes in and our kind of clinical judgment. Do they seem depressed to you? You know, if you've got a teen in there who's sneaking out of the house to try to feel something because they're kind of numb, they'll usually tell you, yeah, that kind of makes sense, and man, this isn't working for me. But absolutely, also, sometimes it's mentioned in the sense of control. Uh, I think the first step with the teens who are acting out just in a developmentally appropriate manner, mm -hmm. but it's like they maintain a sense of control of the behavior and the mood sticks. Absolutely. And it's and it's he, so he's saying it's not necessarily that they have more a team who's doing this more in a developmentally appropriate way is going to have more control over what they're doing and they're not necessarily going to have this thought of like well that didn't work I better do something more I better do something more it's you know it's a little bit different um, in that way so I'm going to go on to the next example so we make sure we get through it all which is school refusal this is something that I see probably more than the rest of the stuff that I, I talk about. Um, and especially people who work at schools, if they're not uh, kind of in the mental health community, this gets labeled as defiance. That kid won't come to school, their attendance is poor, they're truant. Well, I mean, there, there are problems. Kids are legally supposed to be in school, so it, it is a problem. But a lot of times, school refusal, like lots of kids don't like going to school. Most of them can get there anyway. So what's going on in school refusal? Um, these are the kids who can't get themselves to go in the morning. These aren't usually the kids who get there and then they ditch class. These are the kids who can't get in the car to go with their parent to school for some reason. But, you know, if parents, school officials, they don't really know what's going on and so I'll get calls, my kid won't go to school, I don't know what to do. So, here's what we look for to kind of assess that situation. Uh, let's see. Okay. So we know the behavior which is to avoid school. So then we start looking at, at their thoughts. Why don't you want to go to school? What's going on? How come? When you think about the fact that it's time to go to school, what's running through your head? So probably you'll, they'll start with like, I don't want to, right? But what else? What might happen if you did go to school? It's a great question to ask. You're going to get thoughts often that sound like worry thoughts, anxiety thoughts, kind of like uh, my teachers might be mad because I've already missed school. You're looking for um, fears about judgment. My friends will think that it's weird that I miss school. Or think I'm weird. Or I'll get made fun of. Um, if I go to school, this might happen. So kind of like predictions about how bad it will be if they go to school. Um, look for any kind of thought that's like, well, what if I go and the what ifs, um, the predictions of this might happen, that might happen, and the judgments. They'll think this. I know, you know, my friends will notice that I'm anxious being back at school. They'll see my shaking hands and they're gonna make fun of me, or I'm gonna get bullied, or they're gonna spread rumors. It's not that these thoughts are not true. Teachers could be mad, your friends could make fun of you, but those are the thoughts that are informing school refusal due to anxiety. So when you ask them, when they kind of get this, it sort of makes sense, even if the kid's not giving you very much. I mean, anyone who's thinking, oh my gosh, everyone's gonna be mad at me, and then this might happen, and that might happen, my friends are gonna think I'm weird, Anyone thinking thoughts like that is going to be anxious or scared or worried, and this is where 
Ooh, that was messy. Um, this is where uh, you may have to suggest other words like stressed um, or worried because anxiety mm -hmm. might not be the word that they're wanting to use even though like clinically we call it that. Um, but that's what you're going to see here. The physical sensations, really key in anxiety. So they may not be real good with the thoughts. You might have to help them. They may not be good with identifying their mood, especially in the beginning, because that's kind of like where all of this happens is in the initial session or two. What happens physically when it's time to get in the car and go to school? So mom says, okay, here we go. Get dressed, we've got to go to school. What happens physically? Does your heart rate go up? Oh yeah, my heart rate goes up. Hard to breathe, feels like an elephant sitting on my chest. All of these sensations that we know go with anxiety. So fast heart rate, low, like worse breathing. And for kids, lots of, well this is for everyone, stomach aches, that's really common in anxiety. But also headaches, and just generally feeling off, feeling dizzy, sweaty blushing, shaking, all this stuff. That's, that's how you know. Because a lot of times with kids, they may not be able to do this, but they know physically that they're not feeling quite right. So this is kind of what that cycle looks like. Now, there is a big problem with it, and it's because it's the avoidance cycle. The avoidance cycle is a really big problem because it's, avoidance is really, really reinforcing in itself. So. Everybody, think, think about a time where you know you were supposed to do something. Something that was going to make you uncomfortable, but you kind of knew you should do it for whatever reason you decided not to. So you're kind of dreading it, you don't really look forward to it, but you know you need to, and then you decide, you know what, forget it, this time I'm not going to do it. How do you feel that moment you decide that you don't have to do it, you let yourself off the hook? You usually feel so relieved, right? Ooh, okay, good, I don't have to deal with that, right? Sweet, sweet relief. So the problem with that is that that means avoidance in the short term feels really good. Oh, I'm not going to go to school today. I can't make myself go. Mom says, oh, I don't know what to do with you. Fine, you don't have to go. I don't have to go to school. Oh, it feels so good. So then tomorrow when it's time to go to school again, they remember how good it felt yesterday when they didn't have to go. That is very reinforcing. So then they want to continue this cycle. The other problem with avoidance is that it actually sends, it's not necessarily a conscious thought, but it sends the message that this, this going to school thing is too much for me to handle. I can't deal with it, clearly, evidenced by the fact that I haven't been dealing with it. So I can't do it. So then when they try to do it tomorrow, they remember that yesterday they couldn't, so must not be able to handle it. And that yesterday actually felt great because they didn't have to go. So it's really, really important to break the cycle because you can imagine if we keep avoiding school, these thoughts are only going to intensify. I've missed more school now. Everyone's going to think it's weird that I've been gone for so long. I'm going to be so behind in my homework, really anxious about it. Every time they have to go, this is just going to get worse. They're going to be more likely to avoid. So the cycle kind of reinforces itself. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, let's see. OK, so I'm going to move on to the next one which kind of combines the two. And this is, so this is sort of like anxiety cycle. Um, it could be general anxiety. Actually, usually this is social anxiety from my experience. It's usually worry about like the judgment of teachers, other classmates and things like that. But it could be more like school phobia or performance anxiety or something like that. Um, but the last one, homework refusal, kind of combines depression and anxiety. It's gonna depend on the team. Um, which one is more prominent, but it kind of tends to go together. Um, so it's a nice one to tie it together with, with all of this. So. Okay. So for this one, for the first two examples, those might be the call that you get. You get the call from the parent that's like, my kid won't go to school, I'm not sure what to do. School is mad, I don't know how to handle this. Um, in the first one, acting out, my teen is acting out and I, I don't know how to handle that either. You know, Those are the calls you get. Homework refusal, sometimes you get a call about that, but more likely, at least in my clinical experience, this has been something that kind of, it's, it comes along with it. So maybe 
you know, they're having lots of fights at home with the family or something like that. That's kind of the reason they come in. But then, you know, oh, they're also not doing their homework. Or the grades are starting to fall a little bit. Um, so the behavior is, we'll call it homework refusal. And this could be like sitting at the table for like hours and just not getting anything done. It could be throwing a tantrum about homework. Nope, I'm not gonna do it. You can't make me, running and slamming the door. Um, it could just be getting into an argument about it. It could be any of those things, but basically the homework's not getting done. So we know the behavior. So we look at thoughts. If this is not just typical, uh, this is kind of like school. Not everyone likes to go to school. Not everyone likes homework. Most people don't. Um, they get it done though. So like what's going on in this case where it's actually not getting done? And so if we're talking about an underlying mental health concern, that's where we're starting to look at, okay, what are you thinking about when you sit down to do homework? The things that we're looking for here, and I'll put some specific thoughts, but we're looking for poor distress tolerance, like it's not gonna be fun, and I can't handle the fact that it's gonna be that miserable, like it's gonna be too much for me to handle. So poor distress tolerance, um, or overwhelm. I don't even know where to begin. So you hear a lot of this, the I can'ts, like I was talking about a little bit earlier, um, that it's too much. Um, it'll take too long. And you can kind of see in some of these, so the it'll take too long goes with like, I hate it, it's miserable. That's the distress tolerance piece. I can't deal with how bad it's gonna be. But then there's the overwhelm piece that's, it's too much, I'm so behind already, I don't even know where to start. That's when we're looking at overwhelm thoughts. So like, wow, okay, if you're thinking, I can't, it's way too much, you know, I'm feeling overwhelmed, we can put that right here in the mood. Okay, so you're feeling overwhelmed. This is where it could be depression or anxiety. Overwhelmed can be nerves that you won't be able to do it. Worry about if you'll be able to complete it, if you won't, things like that. It could also be depression, like I can't, like I just, sort of like the self-esteem thing, like I don't think I'm capable of that. So it could be either one. You're gonna have to talk to the team to figure out which it is, but I'll just put both here for this, for these purposes. So depression, anxiety, feeling overwhelmed. Um, part of what will help is the physical sensations, again, see, it's such an important part of the model. Um, if they're depressed, they're going to be, again, slow, feel like it takes them forever, or maybe it does take them forever to complete something. Um, really just like low energy, really low motivation. If we're looking at something that's more anxiety, they're going to be more like agitated physically. So if they're really worried about it and they sit down to do it, they might feel their heart start to race, so that fast heart rate again. They might have a stomach ache, which could also be depression. <laughs> um, so it, in, in these situations, I mean, honestly, typically, it's a combination of both. Now, obviously, there's negative consequences to not doing your homework, because when you don't do your homework, you get poor grades, your teachers may get mad at you, your parents get mad at you, there's all kinds of negative things um, that happen because of it. Um, and usually what happens if we look at this cycle, okay, I'm not doing my homework because I can't, it's too much, I hate it, feeling overwhelmed, depressed, having whatever physical sensations contribute to this. Well, when we're depressed or anxious, we know from the first, well, we know from the school refusal example that when we're anxious, we don't want to do the thing that makes us anxious. That's kind of natural. Nobody wants to do the thing that doesn't feel good. So we're likely to avoid our homework, right? Well, also, when we're depressed and we have no energy, we're feeling no motivation, we'd just rather sit around, nothing sounds good to us, we might act out, but if we don't act out, this is the freeze question, we basically avoid again. And it's not because necessarily that we're anxious about it, but just because we don't feel like doing anything. And so then we don't do it. But then we come back up to here and we're thinking, maybe we're even being hard on ourselves at that point. I can't believe I didn't do it. 
what's wrong with me that I can't get myself to do it? All my friends seem to be able to do it. So of course, then we're going to come back to feeling more depressed. They might think, oh my gosh, now I have one more day that I haven't been at school. So I have one more day of homework to catch up on. So then we're having more overwhelm. And you guys can see again how the cycle reinforces itself. So um, do I have any questions about the, uh, these examples specifically? Because the next part I'll get into is the like, how do you do this with a team? No? Okay. So how do we assess? And what's, like, what's important about it? How do we do this? So basically, like I said, the reason I really wanted a whiteboard is because I bought one in my office and um, I love it. And I write on it just like this with my teens, with their parents, and kind of you know illustrate the whole thing. So <coughs> what I'll start with is, okay, we know the behavior, like we know that's why you're here, right? You're doing X, Y, or Z. So what what are your thoughts? Like let's let's have you answer, you know, I'll ask the team directly. Um, this cycle, I can't tell you what great feedback I have gotten about it, putting it on paper or on the board for people to see. Because especially with teens, although I think with adults too, if people get overwhelmed in therapy, especially in the beginning when they're trying to figure out, like, is this relationship going to work? Is this going to be helpful? They can get distracted. Always bring it, you can always bring it back to this. And if they've missed something, here it is in plain writing, right? They like to be able to see that. Um, so we make it real personal. What is their kind of cycle? How is this working for them? So we know the behavior. I ask them, what are you, like, what's going through your head? Just kind of <laughs> like I said out loud with you guys as I was doing this, what's going through your head? Now, with teenagers, sometimes you'll get great answers. Sometimes you'll get, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm thinking. I have no idea. So we have to be, you know, we have to have some other suggestions. So usually one of, like, one of my favorite questions is, if we had to guess what you might be thinking in that situation, what do you think it would be? There's no right or wrong answers here. Let's just take a wild guess about what might be going through your mind. Usually, the reason they can think of a guess that might be going through their mind is because they're familiar with those thoughts. And maybe, maybe not, but usually that's the case. So let's just guess. If that doesn't work, you can suggest some things. Now, unless you have a reason to believe that this team is in it for another reason, like, I don't know, they're trying to get out of something by coming to therapy, or they're trying, there's some, you know, secondary gain or something like that. Usually they want help. Something isn't working. Their parents are mad at them. They're not seeing their friends, whatever it is. They want help. So if you kind of suggest things like, well, sometimes people think this, this, or this, any of that sound familiar? They'll grab onto whatever it is that does apply to them. Um, so you're not saying, like, you probably feel like this, huh? You're not kind of spoon-feeding it to them, but give them some options, you know? Sometimes when people can't do homework, they feel like, you know, they're not capable of it, or they feel like there's too much and they don't know where to start. Does any of that sound familiar to you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I never know where to start, and it just feels like it keeps piling up. Ah, so those are all thoughts. Sometimes you can actually get them to say thoughts and you ask how they feel about it. So when you sit down and think about homework, it's time to do it. What are you think, or what is what is your mood? You know, what do you feel it? Like, well, I don't feel like doing it because I don't like it at all, and there's so much to do. So then you kind of redirect them. Oh, those are great thoughts. Like that's not quite a mood, but hey, that's great. It goes in this thought category. So you're kind of teaching them how to identify their thoughts, which is you're going to be doing CBT, really an important part anyway. Um, so let's see. What else do I want to say about this? Um, the other thing that I like about doing something like this is that it really um, builds empathy. The team builds empathy like kind of for themselves. Like, oh, there's an explanation. There's not just like something wrong with me that I can't do my homework or that I can't go to school or that I'm acting out in this way that I know I probably shouldn't. There's a, there's a reason. It makes sense. Okay. But then for the parent, for the therapist also, because sometimes we can get frustrated too, like, oh, what is going on? We can see it. And for the school, if you can have any school involvement or if the parents can kind of educate the school, there's a reason that all of this is happening. And so instead of it being so frustrating, it can build some empathy, like kind of for everybody involved. So that's really important too. Um, this helps kind of uncover this whole thing when you do it specifically with the team where you're like, okay, well, 
what, what are your physical sensations? What are the thoughts? What is your mood? And again, helping them through it as they learn the process, it really helps you uncover the roots of whatever behavior it is that's concerning. So it might be, like we're focusing on this stuff, it might be the environment. It might be that, you know, there's a lot of arguing going on at home, and you'll see that in, oh, I can't concentrate on my homework because mom and dad are screaming at each other all the time. Oh, okay, there we go. And that may have, you know, mood consequences too, but it really helps you look at, like, what's the root of it? Are we dealing with normal teen behavior? Is there something underlying it? Because sometimes it is normal teen behavior. Uh, let's see. So, one of my favorite parts. Interventions. What do we do with this? Um, so, like I said, I love using my whiteboard. Um, it can be, if you've never used a whiteboard, it can be awkward at first. Um, I know when I started using it, I felt like I was being a teacher. Um, but so, thoughts, those were my thoughts. Um, and I actually have not gotten any feedback about that from anyone. And if I ever feel like it's been like I'm up there too long or something, I'll just kind of make a joke about it. Like, oh, it feels like you're in school, huh? And people tend to like it. They like the visual. But let's say you don't have a whiteboard, you don't want a whiteboard. Grab a pad of paper and just write it out so you both can see it, again, visually. Um, then they can take it home with them and kind of keep the model with that has all of their kind of information on it. Um, I have people on the whiteboard, they like to take pictures of it with their phones and kind of take that home. So there's lots of options. Um, so the first thing you do, let's say, gone through everything that we went through, you've assessed, and you're like, okay, there is an underlying mental health concern that is driving this behavior, and everybody understands the model, parents, team, me, and then now what? So the first step is to make sure that they really understand the model. Um, you want them to understand why this might be happening. So you want to talk to the teenager about like what is motivating their behavior, and it gives you a chance to really kind of normalize it in the context of whatever is going on. Um, so it can build this, this really great relationship with them because you get it, and you get it well enough that you're able to kind of put it all together for them. And so it starts to make sense. Oh, I see why I'm doing that. Okay, there we go. We have kind of a plan here. And so that's another thing like CBT gets a bad rap for is there's no relationship. Well, I really disagree with that, uh, but that's a whole other thing. This is part of how we build the relationship, at least personally, this is what I do, because when part, so much of the relationship is feeling understood, feeling like, oh, you can help me, thank goodness, because I didn't know what to do. When you put it like this, and you really get their input, and you really make sure that they understand it, like that they can explain it back to you, that's when they're gonna feel really connected. Okay, this person gets me, they can help me. And they want it to change, that's usually why they see you. Um, and so that's kind of the, the, the first step in that relationship piece. This also helps them understand the rationale for the things that you're gonna ask them to do. So I'll get to that in a second, but when they can see that their behavior is really reinforcing all of this and that their behavior is kind of getting them into trouble, right? We talked about with all three examples how there's kind of problems with acting out, problems with not going to school, problems with not doing homework, they can start to see it. Now, if we want something to change, we have to change something. That's the hard part. They're not going to want to change the behavior because this is comfortable. Even if it's miserable, it's comfortable. And so explaining it like this and showing them how the cycle reinforces itself, you know, ask them, are you happy with how things are going? You know, do you, this is the result that you're getting. Is that where you want to stay or do you want to do something differently? So that helps kind of increase their motivation for change, which is really important, especially dealing with teenagers. They kind of have to buy in. It's really, really hard to do treatment, which you all know, I'm sure, when they're not buying in and mom and dad think it's a great idea. Yeah. Actually, I wanted to address that, which is what do you have, what do you do in a situation where it's really not mental health? Perhaps what it is they're doing acting out behavior and it's offered them status. Now they're in a popular situation, so they're not motivated in changing. They're liking they're right. liking the new access to promiscuity. They're liking um, the the recognition that they're getting. Right. They just want their parents to get off their back. Right. But well, they're and they're they're passing school. That's all fine. Things have diminished. It's just that they're they're um, they're not motivated to change their behavior because they might lose this newfound. Um, 
peer acceptance? Right, absolutely, great question. So part of it, if we are, depending on how severe the behavior is and how like kind of risky and dangerous it is will depend on how much we intervene here versus how much we kind of say, okay, maybe it's more normal. Um, but with the parents getting off their back, you can use that. Okay, so I understand that you like doing that, but what's the result? So when you do that behavior, what is then the consequence? So that's um, more of like, I don't know if you guys have ever seen like an ABC sheet, but like what happens first, what's the behavior, what's the consequence, we can do one of those with them. Okay, so what ends up happening? Okay, well I get grounded. Okay, well, how much do you like being grounded? How's that working for you? And so sometimes, honestly, like we can really use, I want my parents off my back to motivate change. Now they may not completely stop in that situation, but they might tone it down a little bit. Like, okay, I guess I shouldn't sneak out of the house because that's the worst consequence. So maybe, you know, I'm still gonna try to, I still wanna go to the parties, but I'll only go when mom and dad, like, let me out of the house. So, you know, like, so it may decrease it a little bit. Um, the other thing, and this is more on like the motivational interviewing side, is really kind of trying to show them, have them know, have them think of all of the reasons that this is risky, that maybe this is a problem. So in that situation, they're not going to see that on their own. But asking lots of questions about, you know, what is, like what are the negatives of this and, and the pros? What are the pros and the cons? You know, because again, they're doing this, we all do things for good reasons. There's a good reason that they're doing it. Maybe it's because of status or, you know, yeah, they like being popular or whatever that might be. Um, but what are the consequences? And how do those consequences impact your life? You know, are, they, are there negative consequences to it? And then if there are, kind of trying to show them that discrepancy between what they want their life to be like, like mom and dad to be off their back, and what life actually is like when they're doing these behaviors. Um, and so in those kind of cases, it becomes more motivational interviewing, and also honestly, sometimes even like really behavioral with rewards, like, okay, well mom and dad really don't want you to do it, you don't like getting in trouble, what if we created a reward system? And it's a little harder when the teens get older, but honestly, I've had success with like, with reward sy systems with like, 16, 17 year olds because, you know, they want their allowance or they want to go shopping or whatever it might be. So sometimes you can say like, okay, well if we see, you know, these kinds of behaviors, and that kind of actually ties right in with something else that you do here, we set goals. And so if you can set a goal that's very measurable, like if we, if you don't sneak out for, I don't know how you'd measure that with the parents because they're sneaking out, they're not supposed to get caught, but if you don't, um, don't you, we're going to go on the honor system, you don't use any drugs for, you know, a whole week, then you can have X. Or like, if you're not hanging out with that person um, who we don't like, who they think is a bad influence, you can earn X or something like that, something really measurable. Um, just kind of like the little, I don't know if you guys are familiar with child treatment, but doing like sticker systems, like if you do X, Y, or Z, you get a sticker, and when you get five stickers, you get to pick a prize, kind of like that, we just make it age appropriate. Um, and so you can see a lot of it has to do with motivation because truly, you know, there's not a whole lot you can do once teens get like much older and they're like close to being independent, they are going to do a lot of what they want to do. So we have to increase their motivation and then, of course, if they're doing really extreme behaviors, we're talking about something different. We're talking about like residential treatment or something like that. So what you're talking about is behavior reinforcement. Mm -hmm. if, we, if they want to see a shift in behavior from a maladaptive, unhealthy <coughs> behavior to healthy behaviors, we need to see reinforcement of those healthy behaviors. Absolutely, reinforcement of healthy behaviors, exactly. And ideally, you know, and that that can draw the motivation. That can be the behavioral reinforcement can be the reason that they're motivated to make that change when they otherwise would it be. Sometimes it works, you know. We have to get creative with them. Um, usually, honestly, one of my strategies with them is just to be real honest, you know. Like, I get that you like the popularity, um, and that makes sense, but mom and dad are on your back, and what are we gonna do about it if you don't want them on your back, you know? Well, I'm gonna have to change X, Y, or Z. Um, does that kind of help a little bit? <laughs> uh, okay, so we said set goals. The other thing about goals is we really do want to make them really measurable because otherwise, so like we're like, okay, we've got all of this stuff. I understand the model. Um, 
I'm motivated to make some kind of change, but then what kind of change are we gonna make? And that's where the goal setting starts coming in. Um, and so the very beginning is going to probably be behavior change, and let's make it real specific. You know, I want to go to school all day, every day, that's my goal. So no skipping school, no leaving school early, that's the ultimate goal. Or I want to complete five homework assignments a day, right, something like that. So then we can start changing behavior to work toward that specific goal that directs our treatment. Then we know what to do. Okay, so school refusal is the problem, so we know that the goal is gonna be something about getting you back to school. How are we gonna do it? Let's kind of set some steps up for you know, making sure that you start facing it. So this is the other thing. In, the, in these cycles, like I said, behavior change is usually a good starting point. So if we're talking about anxiety, that means we can't avoid the situation because the avoidance is going to reinforce the cycle. That means we have to face it. And so that's kind of like one of the things. With depression, it's not really so different. It's kind of like this act opposite approach. If you're depressed and you don't want to do your homework, we've got to get you doing a little bit of your homework. If you're depressed and you're acting out, we've got to start having some boundaries. That's a tough one, but usually when it is some kind of underlying depression, the team is more motivated to do it because they kind of know, this isn't really the path I want to be on, I just don't know what else to do. So we set some boundaries and get them to commit to you. Okay, I will not sneak out the window. I promise, between now and next week, I won't. I mean, it's not ironclad, but you know, we, we need their motivation, we need their buy-in, and so we start kind of with that behavior change. Um, with anxiety I had, I run two social anxiety groups and the one for teens, I had a teen, as I was kind of explaining this, she said, ah, so I know what we're supposed to do, we're supposed to avoid avoidance. And I thought that was such a clever way. Truly, that's kind of what we have to do. And that goes for depression mm -hmm. and anxiety. It's this act opposite, avoid avoidance sort of thing. Um, the other thing that's important, like so we've set the goal, kind of no, like starting with some minor behavior change and we want to make it like attainable, so if the goal is to go back to school all day, every day, we don't start there. We start with, can you go for one period tomorrow? Um, and then maybe the next day you can go for two periods and things like that. We just try to make it so that they can handle it. But the other thing we want to do is really monitor their progress. And so it might be that we can monitor it like that. How much progress are they making toward the goal? But there are other ways too. Like we can ask them on a 1 to 10 scale, how depressed are you? How happy are you? How worried are you? And then you can kind of check in with them on that on a weekly basis. Okay, this week, you know, think back over the whole week, how worried were you this week? Um, there are also scales that we can use to kind of monitor that sort of thing. So in the Mind Over Mood book, there are like uh, depression and anxiety scale. They both work great for teens. Um, read through them because depending on your teen, there might be a couple to modify or to remove so that it's age appropriate. But generally speaking, then you have a score. And then you can look at it kind of from an objective point of view. How, how are they doing? Are their scores decreasing and things like that? Uh, the next step after all of this, so we've kind of gone through the, the beginnings of this intervention sort of process. We start with the behavior. Then we move into kind of changing the thoughts, and that is, you know, if I had a part two, that would be what part two would be about. But instead, what I'm going to do is just kind of direct you to the resource list that I have here. So you see Mind Over Mood is one of the first ones. This is where, like, they, they get more into the meat of how do you do the rest of this. So this is, like, the beginning, the assessment, and how do we start. And then to really address that underlying mental health concern that, you know, let's say we've determined that there is one, then we start working on kind of the thoughts and how we change our thoughts and things like that. So these are some great resources for it. If you're familiar with CBT, um, you may not need, like, the case formulation approach, but this is kind of just how do we think about things in cognitive behavioral terms. Um, Basics and Beyond by Judith Beck, she's Erin Beck's daughter. Um, it's a great, like it's like textbook, but it's great if you're interested in learning. But Mind Over Mood, it's a treatment manual. It is like patients can grab it and buy it and work through it with you. It's very user friendly. There's lots of um, worksheets in it. And there's a clinician's guide too if you kind of want you know, more information on how to use it in session. And then there's this wonderful workbook series for teens. Um, shyness and social anxiety workbook tends to be good for school refusal if we determine that that's kind of what's going on. But there's a whole series. I threw up here the uh, 
depression, anxiety, self-esteem, and social anxiety ones, but they're, I mean, there's DBT, there's um, bipolar, there's I mean, so many, and they're great, they're workbooks, they're very user-friendly. They're a little bit young sometimes, um, but even with older teens, I use them, and like, oh, you know, it's kind of silly that it's a little bit young, like, don't worry about it, and then we know that the material is age-appropriate and they're getting it. Um, the website here, Podesky.com, is Christine Podesky's website. There are tons of resources on there, um, lots of information, book recommendations, I mean, everything you could think of, so I just want to direct you to that as well, um, so that if you like this model, and it kind of seems like it could work for you, but you're like, okay, so that's just the beginning, it's just a taste, what next? That's what's next. So uh, I will move on to if you guys have any questions, but I'll, I'll leave that slide out. Yeah. For the individual that's numb and that struggles with that, in your practice, do you necessarily correlate that with depression, or can that be a normal teenager phase? And either way, how do you enter the CBT process? Their thoughts are going to be null. The mood's going to be null. Where do you enter? Good question. Um, it can be normal, um, but they just don't feel a lot. Um, and, it, and it can be depression, so it could be either one. And the way that we start to know is really by like engaging in this. I would ask them, I mean, the things that I'd be looking for are like, I would probably start with if we had behavior, do you think like that, is there a behavior problem in these situations, would you think? Or possibly, possibly not? Could be, from what I've seen, no extreme behavior, just totally, just class. completely vanilla minor attitudes, but other than that. Okay. So it could be in that situation, you could be looking at a couple things. One could be that it's just kind of parents are concerned because, you know, this used to be a really friendly kid and loves their family and now they just sort of want to be by themselves and they're kind of a little bit moody and kind of that vanilla, flat, just, and so that may be normal teen behavior. But what we'd be looking for is, is there anything else? So. Is there, you know, it, what is the problem behavior maybe <coughs> that they're maybe they have a little attitude? Okay, so when your mom, like what makes you have attitude with your mom? That's a question I would ask. Well, it's when she asks me to do the dishes. Okay, when she asks you to do the dishes, like let's just get really, really specific. When she asks you to do the dishes, what's going through your head? And so we'd be looking for thoughts like, that they kind of escalate if we're looking for something underlying like depression that would not be like, oh, I don't like to do the dishes, this really isn't fair, my sister doesn't have to do the dishes, like that's all kind of normal, but keep pushing. Okay, so like is there anything else though? Do you ever like, you know, get really mad at her or, you know, do you ever get mad at yourself for not being able to, you know, do the dishes, is it, you know, I don't know, trying to get like to ask for more information. Is there anything else that you could possibly be thinking? Um, and I would also ask a lot of questions about the physical sensations, because if you've got a kid who's like, no, nope, I'm fine, I don't know why mom wants me here, I'm good, and I don't really have any problems, and I think that behavior is normal, my friends all get in arguments with their parents too, I'd start down here and ask them, you know, how's your energy level usually? Like, how much do you sleep? How tired are you? Teens sleep a lot, but they shouldn't be sleeping like all day on the weekend. That's, that's not normal when it's a consistent behavior. So, you know, what's your motivation level like to do, to get your homework done? Oh, your home, your grades are okay, so your motivation's okay there. Those are the kind of things that you'd start looking at um, physically, and if there's any like red flags there, then that kind of can clue you in, like, okay, maybe this is depression, or, you know, like, oh, I'm shaky a lot, and I don't really know why. Maybe they're just shaky, like some people have tremors, right? But maybe it's anxiety of some kind, um, and so, that's sort of where I would go with it, but it's important not to pathologize something like that. So that's kind of what we look at because sometimes there's mental health concerns. And a lot of times when they end up in our office, there's something going on, but sometimes not. Sometimes it really is parents kind of like worried about why their kid has changed a little bit. And I don't know, my kid's a teenager now. Maybe that's why. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's great in interrelation in, between all of the different aspects there. Um, and uh, to, to, to try to, clar to clarify in the, in the adolescent's mind what is really going on, I think it's brilliant. How often do you, um, in order for the therapy to be effective with the adolescent, do you have to bring in the parents? Uh, it depends on the teen. Some of them prefer to have more of a distant relationship where 
and some of them, some parents just drop them off and they're not really involved. That's not ideal um, to have that much separation, but I think it's really important to have some separation. So what I try to do, I, I couldn't give you like a number, like, oh, every other session we have to have the parent in. Usually in the beginning of treatment, I'll have them in more. I want them to know this because, you know, the parent is the one who, if they're paying, they're paying for treatment. If they're, you know, the team doesn't drive themselves, the parent is dropping them off or bringing them to treatment. Like the parent is invested too. And so I think it's really important that they know what I'm doing with their kid. At the same time, I don't think they need to know everything. If there's anything risky going on, they know. But other than that, you know, I try to keep most of it with the team to build that rapport and that trust. They know I'm not going to run to mom and dad and tell them every little thing that happened. And then I try to tell the team, you know, today I want to talk to mom and dad. I want to kind of explain this to them because I think it might help them so that they know what's going on when you're not doing your homework so they're not yelling at you about it. So instead, they can offer you these helpful tips like, oh, can you, I mean, one of the strategies that it's in all of these materials is how do you, how to do a thought record. So when you get stuck, in this cycle, then here's how you kind of take yourself out of it. I want mom and dad to know that information so that they can reinforce that rather than yelling, which is going to make the kids shut down. So, you know, in the beginning, they're, they're invited in at the end more, although I always tell the team, this is what I'm going to say, is that okay with you? Um, and they know, of course, if there's anything risky, they don't have a say in that. Um, but as kind of treatment progresses, it's less often, um, and, but I do try to keep them informed because, again, like, they may be seeing something I'm not seeing. They're with their kid all the time. I'm with them like an hour a week. Other questions? Okay, cool. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thank you.